that's our spot. That is worth the walk. It's beautiful. So I've got all the pieces in place, and then I'm noodling it through, and it immediately becomes apparent that I can't do it because I don't know how to find the spots. This son of a bitch, Adam, he wrote down every lens he used. He put a chart. He takes a picture. He puts the name of the object, Old Faithful guys, and then the shutter speed, the aperture, and the camera settings, but he didn't write down where he was. And yeah, I know where to find Old Faithful, but he did 10 pictures at the Grand Canyon, and he labeled them South Rim. So think about that. South Rim is 205 miles. Even though he took all these notes, he never wrote down the lab log position of where the tripod was sitting in terra firma. We can use some NASA technology to help us find our way. Even artificial intelligence to help us tell even a better story. My Ansel Adams was really instrumental in conservation and photography. I'm never going to be the next Ansel Adams. But I get to follow his footsteps. I know almost every spot, but a lot of pictures look really different from when I was there year ago, two years ago, and I see some things that aren't being protected, or at least they're changing, and I want to know what have we managed to save and what have we lost. Oh yeah. Yes. It's unbelievable. We want to try to recreate those pictures that were taken 79 years ago to see the changes, what's happening to the landscape, what's happening to these forests, what's happening this perfect time capsule of what the National Parks looked like in 1941 and 1942. Not from a hundred different photographers, just one guy, one camera. It's the closest thing we have to a scientific survey of the state of the parks. The power of an image is capable of changing someone's mindset. That change agent of photography is really powerful if used properly. We can maybe impact someone else's life, or maybe even change the mindset of someone who's passing legislation about our environment, which affects everyone. This is an adventure, and we don't know where it's going to lead us. It's a treasure hunt. It's a mystery to try to find this needle in a haystack. I know that on any journey that you take, you always find at least one. <laughs> you find out more about yourself. This takes the conversation conservation and change and preservation and puts it into something that every single person can identify because this is what happens while you're alive. Your life. Your lifetime. This is the change that's going to happen. And what are you going to do about it? Whoop. Stopped it right there. I have instructions. Uh, my name is Richard Brem, and for the past 10 years, Frank Ruggles and I have been trying to put together a TV show. And uh, let me just tell you how easy that is. We, um, I first met Frank on the phone, and I did not meet him in person for probably about four years. Yeah. And uh, I got off the phone with him. I went to my boss. I said, I just met the most incredible human being. And uh, he has a very unique perspective on, on America, on how we're dealing with our parks. And this guy does anything. And my boss is like, that's a great idea for show. Let me call Discovery. And that afternoon, he called Discovery. And that afternoon, Discovery said, uh, yeah, we're going to do that show. So that was a good start. And uh, that never happened. The, uh, it was one of the... Um, one of the many discovery networks. And uh, maybe a week or so after we had that phone call, there was another phone call from them saying, okay, we're gonna do the show, but we're gonna be, it's gonna be a few months. Give us like yeah, four, six months for this show. And uh, I think by the time we got to six months, the network no longer existed. And uh, my company started to disband. So we're like, okay, still a good show. We should still do this show. And uh, I had been released and was on my own as a producer, and I, I met with this company called Litton Entertainment. And Litton Entertainment, uh, if you ever turn on 
CBS, ABC, NBC, Fox, on a Saturday morning, you will see their programming. And the idea of this, uh, you know, all of us grew up in an era when um, you turn on CBS on a Saturday morning and you'll see Scooby-Doo or whatever. In this era, uh, it's a junkyard. And so the networks don't know what to do with it. They don't put cartoons on there anymore because, you know, there's uh, Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon and whatever. So, um, so they have this space. They didn't know what to do with it. And so what they did was sell it to Lytton. And Lytton would create these shows that are ostensibly educational and ostensibly for teens, except that they always had hunky men. And the audience for it was women of a certain age. I'll just tell you that out front. Uh, so we were... Uh, I went to Lytton and I pitched a show and they too said, we want that show that day. And, um, and that was great. And over the next year, we spent talking about it and they were looking for sponsors. And here's the thing about photography. It is not naturally dramatic on television. And, uh, and we never found a sponsor. I, I don't take the blame for that. I take a, a lot of frustration from that. But uh, anyway, so it, it didn't happen. I ended up at the company I'm at now, Mob Scene. Uh, and he ended up talking to a company called Ovation that uh, is one of the sort of smaller channels, sort of like Bravo in the early days. And uh, Ovation had already sold the show. Like, that's how far we've gotten. They had already sold the show. Subaru was going to pay for it. They were going to air it on their network. And, uh, and that's when they called Frank, only after all that. So Frank's having this conversation. He's like, well, that, They've already sold the show to Ovation and, and Subaru. And uh, it, uh, it never happened. In fact, they never even had a conversation with him about a contract or a deal or how that was going to happen. I don't know how they planned to have a guy to be in his show. Um, so that one fell away. And, uh, and Frank started thinking about how he's going to make this stick. And um, this here, Chasing Ansel, was his... Uh, his solution. Before I ever got involved, he started talking to a gentleman here on my right, uh, Leland Melvin, who, uh, as you may know, is a spaceman and former Detroit Lion and an American hero. And, uh, and I've always thought of Frank in that context as well. That there is a sense of him that is a hero. Uh, just to make this all quite short, um, the, uh, the television show has been in the market for a period of time. We shot this about a year and a quarter ago. And uh, really up to the day, we were finishing conversations. Excuse me, I've got to drink of water. We were finishing conversations with uh, networks, and we were finishing conversations with Subaru once again. And uh, Subaru was very excited about the show. It fit everything they wanted. And this was going to happen. And uh, there's not many things that would have stopped it from happening, but it turns out Frank found one of them. Um, I, I wanted to read a short thing. Um, if uh, you're following along, I invite you to open the uh, Book of Frank to page 7. Um, Frank was my hero. And when I um, first started talking to him, I was fascinated by his photographs, his photographs, but I'm not a photographer. Uh, what I saw in him was something else that I, I really connected to in all the things that I do, but I, I really connected to him as a person, and I connected to the things that he cared about. So uh, this is a book that um, is Frank's magnum opus, or whatever you call it. It's a, it's a masterwork. Uh, the writing especially is a masterwork. I helped him with that. Um, if you come to me after the show, uh, I would uh, be happy to tell you that the parts that I wrote were the good parts. Um, <laughs> there are things we believe in. What do you believe in, Frank? I would ask myself this question as I held open the door of a C-130 aircraft, the dark jungle below hiding who knows what. My parachute was hooked to a cold steel cable, and I was about to he flung into the night sky. What did I believe in? Surviving the jump, for sure. Helping the guys around me stay alive, that too. And maybe even bigger things, like protecting our country and the earth we stand on. 
I knew that serving my country was my destiny. I, I was a paratrooper with the legendary 82nd Airborne, enlisted out of high school, and promoted to sergeant in just two years. I had planned for a lifetime of service to my country, but that was before a training accident nearly cost me the use of my left arm. It stole away my military future. The Army performed three reconstructive surgeries, and I regained some use of my left arm, but I'd never be considered combat reliable. I was devastated. I finished my hitch with the Army with honor, but with few prospects for any civilian future. I was low. But at your lowest point, you ask yourself, what do I believe in? After the Army, I moved to Charleston just in time to experience Hurricane Hugo. I lost everything, my home, my truck, my job, and even my dog. I found myself homeless and penniless, owning nothing but the clothes on my back. I took what jobs I could find, shoveling storm debris into the back of a dump truck for hours a day. And all the while, I searched for a path, for something to believe in again. I worked hard, and after six months, I had a new job, a place to stay, and even a girlfriend. It was my future wife, Lisa, who first introduced me to the magic of photography. She loaned me a camera and taught me how to use a darkroom. I took a job at One Hour Photo and worked on my craft. Uh, as you can see, when you look around the photographs out in the next room, um, Lisa must have been quite a catch to have worked that hard, and that's such beautiful work. Um, I wanted to read one more part, because you don't need to read the whole introduction. You can buy it from Paul at a desk out there. Um, in the years since my assignment as an eminent photographer, I've become an advocate for our national parks. I lecture and exhibit my works around the country, taking my message from grade schools and universities to art galleries and museums. I share stories of what I've seen, plead my case for conservation, and hold out hope that there's enough power in my images to change the world, as W.H. Jackson did, uh, did 150 years ago. Here's what I believe. If I can create a body of work that is beautiful and compelling, perhaps the people I will meet will be inspired to join me in helping to save these beautiful national parks and natural places. That's the best I could ever hope for. As you flip through the pages of my book, my eyes turn to you. Will you be inspired? Will you take a stand by joining me in the efforts to preserve our amazing national parks? Together we can make a difference. I believe in that. Uh, that's harder, actually, than it was this morning when I read that. Um, Frank is, a, is an amazing storyteller. I don't know if all of you know him, but had the opportunity to spend time with him. Uh, I will say this, his stories evolve. Uh, <laughs> I remember he told me, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, uh, tell a story that he told me once. And I do not want to um, claim that I am the authoritarian on this subject, but I do want to tell a story because it is as big as life. Uh, the story is, as Frank calls it, the, uh, the day he saved the world in his underpants. Um, that event happened while he was in service to our country as a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne. And uh, this was a time uh, Reagan was at his peak, and so was the Cold War. And, uh, and we were hammering him. Uh, it, was a, it was a very intense time in terms of military escalation. And, uh, and the Soviets were starting to lose. And, uh, and they turned to the Chinese, as Frank tells me. And, uh, and try to draw the Chinese into this escalating war between superpowers. And, uh, and the Chinese took their time trying to figure out what was the best move for them. And, uh, and so happens that, uh, that a Chinese general, a very senior person in the Chinese military, was invited, uh, perhaps by Reagan himself, I, I don't really know, but uh, he was invited to uh, to see an exercise by the 82nd Airborne. And, uh, and the general agreed, and he came out, and I believe it was at a desert somewhere. If there's somebody that's here that remembers this time, I invite you to, uh, to correct my, 
you know, what I know about this. Anyway, it was, uh, they were out in a desert, and they were all set up. I kind of imagine it like Iron Man, the beginning of Iron Man, when they're all there on chairs waiting to see the display of God's greatest army. And, uh, and then it started, and it was plane after plane after plane, and they released these paratroopers, and the sky was full of, full of these huge umbrellas, these huge parachutes. And, uh, and it was an amazing show of force, but a terrible thing happened. And uh, there was some accident, I don't, I don't know or remember what this was, but uh, something happened with the release and there were a number of uh, paratroopers who were killed, I think. There was a collision mid-air, I, I don't know. Um, certainly the people down on the ground, including this Chinese general, were there to witness uh, a really tragic event. And, uh, and yet, they carried on. And the planes kept coming, and the planes kept coming, and the people kept dropping out of the sky. And at the end of the exercise, the uh, American counterpart part to this, uh, to this uh, Chinese general came to him and, uh, and what do you think? And, uh, and he was very solemn. And, and he said, I, I would like to speak to uh, one, one of your soldiers. And uh, that was an unusual request, but they were happy to provide. And so they went to the barracks and they opened the barracks door and I believe there's only two people there. That's the way he described it. One was Frank Ruggles, and one was a, a, another soldier. Uh, and it was, you know, that whole Forrest Gump thing. Sir, yes, sir. They all stand up. And uh, unfortunately, Frank had nothing on except for a pair of underpants. I, I can only imagine what underpants those were. But that is what he was wearing. And the, uh, the general walked this uh, Chinese general over to, uh, to Frank. As the sergeant, I guess he would be the one he would pick. And the general said, I just witnessed an amazing show of force, but I also saw a number of men died, and yet you continued in this exercise. Why would you do that? And to this, Frank replied, Sir, because we are the 82nd Airborne, the greatest fighting force the world has ever known, and there is nothing on God's green earth that will stop us from completing our mission. And the general was shaken, his face turned white, and uh, from that moment on, he decided that American soldiers are crazy, and, uh, <laughs> and, and decided that he was gonna put his chips behind America, and that was the end of that. Um, you know, we, we questioned this story when we heard it, uh, <laughs> as you might imagine. He tells me, once again, I, it's, I hear from him, but he was uh, working with, uh, I think, the Army Museum for a time, and, uh, and there were stories being passed around, old guys sharing their whatever, and, and, uh, and Frank told this story, and uh, one of the senior guys was like, wait a minute, that was you? And, uh, and indeed, according to Frank, in the world according to Frank, this was a, a thing that happened. I love Frank. Um, he was a brother to me. He was my best friend. And uh, I don't know if you felt the chill in the room. That was about 15 guys in the room who were all saying, no, wait a minute, I'm his best friend. <laughs> but that is, uh, that is Frank Ruggles for you. He lied to every one of you. That's, uh, <laughs> um, no, he was, um, a man of uh, incredible honor and, and, and really a life force. I, uh, I, I find this day astonishing because how could I imagine there be a moment when he was not there? And, uh, and, and I wish I could have had one more day. If only to ask him what that real story was, because I just made that up. But um, I'll tell you one more story. Uh, we went to, um, hold on. We went to Katmai, and uh, I'll tell you, I was in the middle of a, a really rough period of, in my life, and uh, he, he wanted me to come. He really wanted me to come, and uh, 
I was like, Frank, I just I haven't worked in a year and a half. I, I just, I can't, I'll cover it. And, uh, and he did. And I am forever in his debt uh, because this was the adventure of my life. I don't know if you know about Katmai. Katmai is a national park off of uh, Alaska. It's, if you think of Alaska as this big face, this is like the beard and it's down here. And really the only way to get there sensibly is uh, by seaplane. And when you arrive, you drop onto the water and it putters in. And the first thing you see are two bears just sleeping on the beach. And that's what I came to see was bears. Uh, I love bears. You can perhaps tell why I feel a connection to bears. Um, and I, th I would say it is like Jurassic Park with bears. They are everywhere. They walk through camp. I remember seeing a ranger with like a little stick hitting them to get them out of the, they're, they're young bears. They're giant bears, bigger even than me. And uh, uh, I, I'd never seen such a thing. Another thing I had never seen, we were um, walking from where our tents were to kind of the main cabin area of the park. And some guy comes running down and he says, there's a bear right over there. And, uh, and so we stopped and went through the little woods and right in the water, just bobbing in the waves, was this bear. It was like a circus bear, honestly. I, I still, and actually, I, I just wrote a children's story, because that's a thing I do. And, uh, and I had in my mind, from that moment forward, this bear that just bobbed in the waves. And uh, it was such a beautiful sight. And it was like, what's he going to say to me? Because <laughs> that's what this bear would do. He would say something to you. He didn't say anything. He was after salmon. and. Uh, and after time, Frank was taking pictures on the beach of this bear. We were far too close. Uh, they tell you not to get, I think, 50 feet from a bear. Uh, I think at moments he was probably eight feet from, uh, from this bear when he came onto the beach. And he brought his salmon with him. So he was distracted. He really didn't give a shit about us. He was focused on the salmon. And he kind of parked himself on the beach. And, and, and Frank? went into this other zone. And uh, if I said something to him, uh, he would not have heard it. I, I, I respected his space, so it felt sacred to me as he took pictures. And there was just this connection between him and the bear as he was trying to find this photograph. Uh, and I, I'll always be moved by that. And actually, to me, that is the signature moment of Frank that to him, this man who was godless in many ways uh, found his God in, in his photography. We, um, he had this idea, and we talked about it for weeks, so I'm not saying this was a spur of the moment idea. He had this idea for weeks, and the idea was he wanted everybody. You go to Katmai, and you go at the galley or whatever it's called, and all these people are lined up at a picnic table, and they all have their laptops in front of them. And you see these pictures, and they're beautiful pictures. Let's be honest. How can you go wrong? It's a bear. And uh, they have these beautiful pictures of, of bears. And you know they have these lenses that are bigger than my arm, which is saying something. And uh, they're all the same. Everybody took the same picture. And then they change, go to the next picture. And it was, frankly, also the same as the same picture that they had just shown and every other picture in the place. Frank did not do that. Frank took one picture. And it was a picture that he saw in his head. He created the picture, a very Ansel Adams thing to do. He, he chose his moment. So Frank had this idea. I don't know if it's connected to the artist in Frank, or you can make your own decisions. But his idea was, how do I get a picture of a bear and a salmon, but from the salmon's point of view? And how do you capture that shot? And I kept asking him, how, how do you plan on doing that, Frank? Are you going to go into the water? How, how does that happen? And, uh, and he showed me what his plans were when we arrived. It was a, um, uh, I should say, is Rudy here? I don't know if I've seen Rudy, but Rudy was also with me on this amazing trip. Um, so his plan, one second, was a Ronco pocket fisherman. So he had this little thing, and the idea of it is you could hold this little thing and throw the line out and catch your fish. Only what he did is he found a piece of 
of wooden bark that was about the size of a salmon. And he tied it to a GoPro camera, which is a little basically pocket-sized thing. Uh, not the best camera in the world, but, um, but you could set it to take a picture every five seconds. And so this was our device for today. And we went out to a, a, a river that's kind of right in the middle of uh, the preserve. And there was a bear about the size of six of us uh, sitting in the middle of the river. I actually you probably saw it. It was probably on that video. Um, and Frank's idea was he was going to wade into the river, which he did better than anybody. Uh, and he was going to cast this line so that the water would carry our little floater right to the bear. This was like 45 minutes. I, he never, it was like over here, over there, trying to get it to go in. And, uh, and finally, it just hit the mark. And it went right in on the bear. And he was holding it back. And you could see the bear starting to notice the little floater. And he reaches for it. And it was at that moment that Frank decided he did not want to lose his little GoPro camera. They cost about 400 bucks, and uh, he wanted it. So he starts pulling back really quickly. And, uh, and the bear watches this floater start to disappear. And that's the point when he looked up and he saw Frank. Knee deep in the river, far from the shore, slipping on the rocks, and, uh, and the bear started to move. And I don't know if you've ever seen this, but a bear actually moves pretty quick when, uh, when inspired. And uh, I have all this on, on, uh, on film. I was filming the whole thing. So you can see Frank out there in the water and pulling this thing back in. And then Rudy and me are like, Frank, uh, Fra I think it's time. Frank, Frank, I think it's time to come in. Rudy was off. Uh, and then there's a moment when I think it was eight feet from and then you see on the, f the video footage, like I'm there, I'm Frank, and then all of a sudden, it's like a flash of blue, and then nothing. And it's me dropping the camera and getting my ass out of there. <laughs> and the thing is, Frank lost his camera that day, and so the next day he went back. Same bear in the river, same, and Frank came back with his prize. I did not go back, by the way, just to let you know. I had, I'd had my full, not of bears, but, uh, but certainly of that. Um, I think I've had more than my time. Uh, but I want to thank you all for coming. He's, uh, he was a big person in my life. Oh, I did want to say with this, did I tell you this? Chasing Ansel. Anyway, the show, uh, I don't know what happens now. I hope there's a future. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, Lisa, for inviting me to be here. And this is tough. Um, we've been grieving for the past few days, almost a week. Um, and I could say that I hope that everyone here is finding some comfort because we're all connected to Frank, probably less than, you, less than six degrees of separation or whatever you call it. Um, we knew each other all through Frank because of the person that he was. And he was a soldier who never stopped serving, basically. He was an artist who always pushed the limits of his craft, a passionate conservationist, a maker of things, and a friend who endeared himself to all of us in so many ways. You didn't have to meet Frank for more than five minutes to know who he was. And I'll relay a couple of short personal stories that I hope all of you can relate to. So the first, first time I met Frank, it was less than 10 years ago actually, uh, through a mutual friend of ours, who called me up one day and said, hey, John, you gotta meet this guy, Frank just out of the blue. And I said, okay, what's the deal? He goes, it's an amazing photography, he's an amazing guy, you gotta meet him. All right, so what did you, invite him over the house, whatnot? He goes, no, I'm gonna set you up on a blind date. <laughs> really, okay. 
I got it. So went down to difficult run. It's kind of a miserable day, miserable day in November. There's nobody there except one Jeep with an airborne sticker on the back. <laughs> got Frank. All right. But he wasn't around. So I'm sitting there for a few minutes. And just like a magic, I'm looking around the Jeep. He's not there. I'm looking around the trees. There's no leaves for him to hide behind. And then I turn my back, and he's right there. And he's, hey, I'm Frank. And you all know what I'm talking about. That instant, magnetic, larger-than-life personality. And for the next couple of hours, we walked on Difficult Run, took some pictures. But I think more than that, we gabbed about everything, military, photography. And he talked ad nauseum all the time about his friends. That's the guy he was. Sorry. He was so many things. Frank was a real complex guy. And what was interesting over time was to realize behind this huge, extroverted, talented person was also someone who was very introverted. He had drive inside of him. And he had a sim simple look at the world around him. And I think that's something that he all imparted and continues to impart on us, to not get so wrapped up in, in the things that we can't control, and to appreciate the smaller and simpler things in life. And that's what I loved about Frank. He would always stop to smell the roses. And the last story I'll leave you with, we were on a trip one of his many trips uh, across the states in pursuit of finding additional images that, that, or additional scenes that Ansel had photographed. And so Frank lived off of wrapped things, you know, hot pockets, whatnot. <laughs> and I could appreciate that. He was on the road. He wanted to go, go, go. If you know Frank, when he had a plan, he was he was on his own timetable. So at one point, we're coming through Albuquerque to see some friends and, and take a break. And I said, Frank, I'm going to cook you some dinner. And we're going to stop at Trader Joe's. The look that I got from him without opening his mouth was, oh, hell no. <laughs> I'm not going into Trader Joe's. So I said, Frank, drop me off here drive around a couple times, and I'll come back with some food. Fast forward a few days. We're in the Badlands, parked on an incline. There's a storm coming in. We're trying to take pictures out of the camper door, and it starts raining sideways. So I decide, time for dinner. I said, all right, sit down, put on a movie. I'm cooking. So I start, start making sauce and whatnot, and I'm cutting up a bunch of garlic and as I take the garlic and drop it in the pan, I said, do you like garlic? And he goes, no. Nope. <laughs> I said, all right, well, it's going to be good. Don't worry about it. So we finished. You know, he said, said he had a good meal. I think he even called Lisa and said, John, this fixed me a good meal. But I knew the whole camper stunk. <laughs> so, so we finish up, clean up and decided we we're going to move on to the next campground. We were on an incline. And we start down the road, and not more than 100 feet, there's a porcupine in the road. And Frank's like, holy cow, it's a porcupine. And I'm like, yeah, it's cool, it's a porcupine. Let's stop. So we, it had been raining, remind you. So we grab our phones. There's nobody on the road. The camper's in the middle of the road. And we're chasing this porcupine who's waddling across the road, and he he scampers up this hill, and we follow him for about three steps. And we look down, and our boots look like concrete is around him because all the wet mud was around him. We couldn't move, and we're cursing this porcupine. We're yelling at him as he's walking up the hill. God damn porcupine. So anyway, all that to say, that's Frank. For all of his talents and his drive, and everything that he did, 
everything was, was exciting to him. The people that he met, he would, he would stay with the, with the kid at his book signing and talk to the kid for 20 minutes and see the kid's eyes light up. And he just appreciated those moments. His life was built on all of these thousands of moments that make up the stories that we can all share. And I hope that, I'm sure you all feel the way I do, is that we'll take that forward. And that's how we'll honor his legacy and stop to smell the roses and appreciate the small things and appreciate one another. The last thing I, I want to say is, I don't know many of you, um, but I know a lot of you through Frank. The time that we had together, he spent a lot of time talking about other people and other people's character and their integrity. And he surrounded himself with those types of people. So as we celebrate his life and mourn his passing in the short time that we have together, I hope that we'll all spend some time and talk about the great things that Frank has done for our nation, for his friends, for his wife, Lisa. And we'll just continue to, to remember all the great things that he did for us. Is Jerry Kern here? Jerry, come on up. I'm going to put you on the spot, brother, if you're ready. How can I be ready? Thanks. Hey, everybody. I'm another one of Frank's best friends. <laughs> <laughs> he did have a lot of them, right? Um, I met Frank 30 years ago in Charleston at the legendary bar ACs. Some of you know about that bar. Um, I was playing in a band. We used to play in the little window at ACs. And since I was a musician, Frank and I would talk about music. And he shared some of his music with me that he was writing. He was never really in a band at this point, but he shared some of the stuff he was writing. It was so unique and creative, like everything else he did. I just thought, man, I got, I got to be in a band with this guy, right? So we started our own band. Um, it was called the De Niro's. And uh, it was me and Frank and Scott and Shannon. And um, there was a song by the De Niro's called Stanley. <laughs> there may or may not be a dog named after that song. <laughs> um, and uh, the first line in that song was, uh, amigos and first loves are few. Now, it kind of doesn't make sense on the surface because we all have a lot of friends, amigos. But this, is about, this was about real friends, right? Those once-in-a-lifetime friends. And even though he has a bunch of best friends, he was the once-in-a-lifetime friend. So we could confide in each other. We could stay up all night and solve the world's problems. And we can laugh and be silly and creative and philosophical and talk religion and sports and everything else. And all those things that you can do you know, when you're purely comfortable around someone. Um, and and he, he was that guy for me. Um, he just had this incredibly positive impact on my life. And uh, I, I hope I gave him a little bit of that back. You know. So we were, we were very tight. Um, but we did, funny enough, once have a conversation about what we would each say if this happened. And that was a long time ago. That was in Charleston. And I asked, I asked him, if it were me, to just you know, make me sound a lot better than I really was. <laughs> and Frank said, make him smile. That's it. Make him smile. So I have a story that's going to make you smile. All right? So Katie and I moved to Virginia. And uh, shortly after that, Frank and Lisa moved to Virginia. They lived in the same town as us. They lived in Herndon. And they wanted to get to know some friends and start socializing, so they came to a party with us when they knew no one at the party, right? Now, this is the guy. Sorry, Lisa, I'm telling this. <laughs> this is the guy who came face to face with bears, jumped out of airplanes, and repelled down cliffs, and all the other things he did. He had no fear. But he also had no fear in situations where we all have fear, like when you walk into a party and you don't know anybody, and you're, you're intimidated, right? Well, this is how Frank handled that situation. 
So we knew no one, they knew no one at the party. Katie and I already made friends there. I don't remember what Lisa's costume was. It was a Halloween party. I don't remember what mine was, and I don't remember what Katie's was, but everyone who was at that party remembers Frank's costume. So Frank was, Frank was Tweety Bird. <laughs> oh, that's not the funny part. <laughs> Frank bought a Tweety Bird costume that was made for a four-year-old child. <laughs> He stretched it on to himself. <laughs> he had it stretched on, went in the party, stood in the kitchen with a cigarette, his tattoos and his hairy chest, and army boots, and this Tweety costume, and just stared at everyone at the party for the first 20 minutes. Uh, obviously, uh, you all know what happened after that. He made a million friends, and at the end of the party, everyone loved him, right? So anyway, for those of you who didn't know that story, I wanted to put that picture in your head. Um, and it made some of you smile, so that's good. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm going to keep this short. That's it. I just wanted to keep my promise, try to make you smile a little bit with a, with a story from Frank. And I'm going to leave you with a quote from Charles Bukowski, which is, uh, Charles Bukowski said, if you're going to try, go all the way. Otherwise, don't even start. If there's anyone who embodied that quote, it was Frank Ruggles. And man, I love that guy. So thank you. That's it. Lisa's fear was that I would go last. I knew Frank. We all know Frank. July 4th, outside of this room, is a day of celebration and remembrance. For those of us in here, it's not a day that we will forget. Some of us lost our battle buddy, his 505th teammates, his army buddies, his photography friends that have been mentioned by Richard, Jerry, John. I met Frank in 2009. I went to Ace Camera, Ace Photo in Ashburn, Virginia. My office was across the street behind the Redskins facility. Don't hold that against me. I was a Cowboy fan <laughs> then, not so much since. <laughs> I'm a canine handler, SWAT operator for the federal government. I've got my canine with me. He's in the back of an armored truck. I need to make a run to the camera store in Ashburn, not Baltimore. I stop at Ace Photo. I pull up the front parking lot, and this larger-than-life bear bowls me over, busting out the front door. Knocks me over. I draw my pistol. I'm an ATF agent. I'm a canine handler. I've been in this situation before. I don't look behind me. I'm looking in front of me, thinking that Ace Photo is being robbed. My due diligence. I call Loudoun County Sheriff's Office, dial 911, describe me, start clearing the store. I don't find any bodies. I don't find anyone. Come back out. And who's sitting in the front seat of this armored truck? The larger-than-life bear, Frank Lee Ruggles. We hit it off, although he did caution me to put my gun away, because I came out with my gun out, because Loudoun County Sheriff's Office is running code. And we went on numerous adventures after. A dozen national parks and state parks. We formed a team called the A-Team after the show. If you've seen his postings or mine, or Paul's or Leland's or John's, John was one of the original four. Then we became two when John PCS overseas and we lost the fourth. So it was Frank and I as two. Frank meets Paul and you'll hear from him. We became the three amigos. Three Musketeers. I always got slammed for being the shortest one of the two. Well, when these two guys get up here next to Richard, 
I looked even smaller. I, really, I redefined the term midget. But you will find most of your tactical operators are my size. Because big guys don't get in small holes as well as little guys like me. So with that being said, I learned about Frank's humility. I learned about his servant heart to his country and to his community. Maybe not as a Christian or a, a full believer or a believer, but he knew where God stood with me and I stood with him. Over the years of my career, I had 33 surgeries and broken bones. I shared that with Frank in the potential loss of his arm. The blessing was that Frank almost lost his arm and he meets Lisa. Maybe if he had lost his arm, none of us would be here. But he captured a sense of our national parks, of our God-given beauty that is nowhere else in the world. The pictures on the wall, on the walls, I was there for most. The pictures in the book, same. But he always had that same energy, that same passion. Little kids, dumb ATF agents that don't know how to work a camera off of automatic. Let's shoot aperture priority. I'm like, WTF, what does aperture mean? I learned he was humble enough not to be condescending, but he was that way with everyone. Loved him as a brother. So let's not grieve in his loss because heaven gained. A photographer, not of eminence that he was, but of preeminence, he sits at the right hand of God. And now we can have that conversation with, with Ansel Adams. Where the hell are the rest of these photos? <laughs> and I know Paul languishes in trying to finish the 79-year project. We're going to create a legacy between his battle buddies, Leland, Paul, John, myself, Richard, Lee, behind the camera. I'll leave you with this. Jeremiah 29:11 is our company motto. Whether you're a believer or not. For I am God, and I know the plans I have for you. Not to despair, but to prosper. I tell you this. He is prospering in heaven. He's also asking, WTF, why are so many people overdressed? <laughs> because we should all be in khakis, photo attire, a vest, and the bane of Lisa's existence, hiking boots. <laughs> Do they not make them with polish and shine? No, Frank, go get a pair of Johnson Murphys. No. You don't have to now. For his battle buddies, Till Valhalla, till Valhalla, look it up. I don't have the words to describe it, but it's two words, till Valhalla, love you, brother. Thanks, Brad. I'm sure he missed again. <laughs> Gonna set up for a second. For those of you that don't know, Buddy Bison. I uh, I had the privilege, and I'm gonna break up, and I'll try to stay sane here. I had the privilege of going many times with Frank to national parks where he gave a presentation, where he was hawking his books, where he came to the they came to the stand, and he put Buddy Bison up first, and he'd give the story. So I happened to be in Frank's studio yesterday. Buddy was staring at me and I knew Buddy needed to be here, so a little bit of Frank there to give me support. And uh, now I gotta get mean, because I'm gonna fight anybody 
that says that they're his best friend. <laughs> I'll take you on, Richard, as big as you are. I'll take you on, Leland, as fit as you are. Anybody that's out there in that la-la land of social media, I will fight any of you. And it's a testament to the man that after two minutes of meeting him, you felt like you were his best friend. You had that heart that just tied right in. I don't like people. I am an unfriendly person. I was at Lisa's house last night, and I was hugging everybody. I don't hug people. And if you saw me earlier, I hugged every one of our team that came in. That's because of Frank. Because every time I talked to Frank, and it was our last conversation, we'd split. I don't know what it was. I hugged the man, and I said I loved him. I don't do that to people. But Frank got that out of me. Frank would sit with me, and we'd be eating something, and he'd say, Paul, your problem is you just don't engage with people. He said, watch, I'll teach you. And he says, we go up to pay the bill, and he says, he says this is how you do it. He goes, hey, Joe, how's your day going today? He says, you never say hi. You always say, how's your day going? You get them to engage, Paul. You do this. And he'd talk with them, and five minutes later, John's his best friend. So he says, I want you to try this after me. So we, we go to the next one. He says, you try this. I says, I want to Hi, Jane. How's your day going? She's like, crap. <laughs> I turn around to Frank and I go, you want to take this? <laughs> and by God, he did. And, and I'm sure she's on social media as one of the people that, that's posting as a best friend. Says, that's Frank. He could do that. He taught me to love a little bit better than I could. He taught me to be able to hug these folks. He taught me to be able to talk to you guys. Pretty damn amazing. I was at his cabin a month and a half ago, and he looked at me one morning when I came down the stairs, and he said, if anything happens to me, he says, you got to take this. And I said, Frank, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I was along for the ride. I was in the Jeep. I was having fun. I didn't take notes. I'll take it, because Frank asked, and I'll do it with your support. We uh, reached out to a few of you guys this week. Uh, Mark Vanetti is not here. He helped with the obituary. Um, several people helped with the obituary. Several people helped with the presentation, the pr program today. That was our team coming together. I'm going to need that team to come together. I'm going to work with Lisa. We're going to do something. But I want to tell you something about this book and these pictures. You know, I sat with Frank at some low moments when. He sat for six hours in Grand Canyon and didn't sell one of these books, if you can believe it. Made 30 friends, didn't sell a single book. And he hurt. And we talked about a lot of things. And part of that was that, you know, we look at Frank as a photographer, you go out and you see his pictures, and you look through this beautiful book. This was Frank's passion, it was his photography. It was not his love. He had love for Miss Lisa. Always called Miss Lisa. He had love for the National Park. That was his love. There's a difference between him and Ansel. Ansel loved photography and had a, had a, had a passion for the National Parks. Frank had a passion for photography and had a love of National Parks. He said this was his love letter to America. To you who own the National Parks, you own them. This was his love letter to tell you Respect them and love them. Go out to them, see them, take more pictures of them. It's what he wanted us to do. It's all he wanted anybody to do was go to your national parks. See the beauty that you have as an owner. Save it, protect it, be a part of it and share it. I lost my brother. And I'm lost. And I know I can find him again. I need to touch him. I can go to Sequoia and I can grab a tree and I can feel his strength in that tree and in the bark. If I go to Yosemite, I can look at that granite wall and I can see his strength in his face. If I go to Glacier and look in the crystal waters, I can see his eyes shining. Frank had one message and it's part of the Sansel program. It's part of everything that you talked about doing. It's in national parks. He loved them. He wanted you to go to them. He wanted you to experience them. He wanted you to love them. And take pictures 
and share them. Share your love. Look for that sunrise. Look for that sunset. Because those were the hours that were the best. And if you want to find Frank, that's where you're going to find him. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to head out to a national park and I'm going to talk to my friend. I'm going to have a conversation. I'm going to call him a few names. <laughs> and I'm going to touch him. And I encourage all of you to do that too. I, um, I am not Frank's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, been with Frank probably six times in, uh, in our collective lifetimes. Um, I met him at Ace Photo in Ashburn that Brad talked about. I was looking to buy a camera. I met him in DC when I wrote my book, Chasing Space. Um, and he was there for the book signing. And then we came together around this Chasing Ansel program. And one of the things that I'm really jealous about is that I have not had the time that John, Brad, Richard, Paul, Jerry have had with Frank. They have stories. They have connection. They have love for each other. I love, I love Frank like a brother. We were getting there. But this Chase, Chasing Ansel program was about bringing people together to understand how to make our world a better place, how to make our civilization better. Because we were going to take the look from space of the planet. And when I think about you know, being in space and looking back at the planet, you know, Frank is floating around there somewhere right now thinking about instead of having to wait 24 hours for the golden hour at sunset, a sunrise and a sunset happens every 45 minutes in space, so he can get it every 90 minutes. <laughs> and I know he's going to enjoy that. There's an Inuit Eskimo saying, it's called Nuranapuk. It means take extravagant pleasure in being alive. Frank took extravagant pleasure in being alive every single day. We talked about him being a hero. I never used the term hero because I always thought it was a, a sandwich. <laughs> but when I look at the work that Frank has done, when I look at the things that he's done to inspire people, Paul talked about how he was trying to convert you into an extrovert to bring people along for the journey. And that's exactly what Frank does. He brings people along for the journey. It's a story. Life is about the stories. So the stories that you guys have shared have inspired me. The story that Frank tells every day through his camera inspires so many. We have some kids in here. Could you please stand up? OK, come on, don't be shy. All right. We were doing this project around one human lifetime. 79 years is the average human lifetime. OK, you can sit down. We were doing this for you, for your children, for your children's children, because you are that next generation of explorers. And Frank is the penultimate explorer. I went to space. Frank went to inner space and inspired and motivated and challenged. Chasing Ansel brought together chasing light and chasing space to combine it into something that's really powerful. I miss my brother, Lisa and family. I send the condolences from you know my family. My two dogs, Zorro and Rue, they wanted to be here um, to see Stanley exactly because they met up at the cabin. and. They ran and ran and ran and ran. But, uh, but another thing that, that Frank had a tendency to do is if there was something that you told him. Now, I know the underwear story about the thing. You know, Who knows if that's true, but 
I, I told him a story about what happened to me in space. On two missions, Space Shuttle Atlantis, got to space, I lost my cookies, okay? And when I told that to Frank, we were shooting the sizzle for Chasing Ansel. And Frank grabbed his guitar, and he started going into the excruciating details <laughs> of what it's like to lose your cookies in space. <laughs> it was magically, beautifully done. Right? <laughs> and so I want to share what Frank put together while we were shooting Chasing Ansel. in space into space vomit. <laughs> Jerry said it best, he wanted us to make people smile. Let's honor his legacy. We grieve him, we miss him, but there is so much more work to be done through the foundation, maybe a foundation, some other things, chasing Ansel, but the key is to make sure that we carry on that legacy of what Frank Ruggles has done to inspire that next generation. Thank you and Godspeed. Words can't describe Frank Lee Ruggles, his passion, his friends, his wife, his brother, Bobby, where are you? What are you doing out there? <laughs> this concludes a memorial, a gathering, a celebration. As Leland said, Remember it. Don't go to Mexico. Go to Utah. There are five great national parks. Go to Washington, D.C. Those monuments will not stay up forever. If you've never been there, for the veterans that have been there, the Korean War Memorial at night can put you in tears. But go see Frank's passion. It's on the walls. Played behind earlier. Outer space, inner space. I appreciate all of you being here. I know Lisa would love to hug you, shake a hand, hear from you. She sits up front for refreshments over here on the side. Please come up and say hello. Safe travels. We've got to speak.